sunny side i need to redo that <laughs> see how good i was at that though that now i'm gonna yeah. screw up the second one Welcome back to the Side by Side Guys Off Road Podcast. I'm Big Z, and I'm joined via uh, Zoom today. See, I told you I was going to screw this up. From Southern <laughs> California, in the sunny city of San Diego, we have Adrian Oriana from Rancho Racing. How are you doing, bud? Good, man. Happy to be here. I appreciate the invite. Thank you. So last time we talked, we were actually in uh, Hurricane uh, Utah at UTV Takeover. Uh, kind of give me a rundown. Just how did that event go for you? Yeah, it went good, man. Um, super rad to just branch off from the racing side of everything and. Uh, kind of hang out with the boys, hang out with the PRP guys, the Dune Destroy guys, and kind of in their backyard with the sand dunes. And then also a little bit in my backyard with rock crawling and just kind of the desert stuff. So super cool week, man. It was, uh, Hurricane Utah is obviously definitely a, a, a top top of my tier to, to be going to that. Yeah, it's so scenic and beautiful. I mean, you can't really go anywhere without seeing something cool that you would like to take a picture of. Um, it's always a good time, especially for uh, athletes and guys that sponsor brands and, and stuff like that that um, need to get some content. It's always a good place to get some content. Yeah, definitely. Yeah, they got everything there for sure. So so uh, last time we talked, you were kind of stuck between two boys in a hot tub. Uh, what was kind of the fallout <laughs> for you on that one? Uh, I've been asked to do uh, special appearances. And... Uh, <laughs> <laughs> did any of them involve couches <laughs> <laughs> something about a only fans i don't know, something, something about, I don't know. <laughs> hey it's becoming more popular these days i mean it's more accepted right yeah <laughs> <laughs> so uh the reason we had you on the show is uh you know you do things right you are a utv mm -hmm. racer you you race across the country and and sometimes other countries and uh so you were getting your cars ready to go you know take on baja <laughs> i mean what else did you have did you have a race before baja or was baja the first one after utah uh so right after utah um it was the baja 1000 um my buddy justin lampert uh runs cognito motorsports uh he asked me to help him drive his car so we kind of joined joined forces and all that stuff and uh, i got to drive like 400 and something miles or something like that of the Baja 1000. Unfortunately, it didn't go as planned. Um, it was going good until it wasn't. Uh, Justin gave me the car, flawless car, and uh, gave me the car with like a 12 minute, 15 minute lead. Um, he started third, and then that was like race mile 300 or something like that. And then I took it all the way to 700, but at race mile 640, I think it was, um, the motor ended up letting go. We had like a 22 minute lead on second place, and, and we were just cruising. It was just, part failure unfortunately nothing i did nothing he did um it was just bad luck and uh so yeah so we uh unfortunately had to load up the car early so was that a, a engine failure or a transmission failure yeah no engine um it looked like it was like the the prop shaft for the turbo actually blew out and caused a whole bunch of other damage so um yeah it was just super unfortunate but it was a good experience we were doing good um i got all the night section all that stuff and, and everything was going to plan until you know, just bad luck, you know? So when we're talking about prepping for a Baja race, first of all, there's a mindset of, you know, you're going to drive so flipping far. Um, you know, most guys don't Ironman it, but some, I guess, do. But uh, the the concept is you're you're going roughly 1,000. They were over 1,100 or something like that this year, right? Yeah. Something. Mm -hmm. So, uh, but the idea of racing, uh, a lot of the common UTV drivers um, we just think racing's a, you know, jump in and go for it. Right. Like it's, mm -hmm. it's an easy thing to do, but it's, it's very athletic. You have a lot of cardio, you got a lot of stamina you have to have. And, um, I've heard that, uh, firefighters have a good amount of stamina for the, for the thing, <laughs> 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 but, uh, the, the concept about pre prepping for a race is, you know, in America, we're very focused on short course. There's a lot of short course racing. Yeah. Um, desert racing is a little bit more extreme. You're going out for hundreds of miles and then Baja racing is a whole different league of racing um kind of what's your mindset going into prepping for a baja race maybe how that contrasts <laughs> to race in america and and kind of where where do you land getting ready for for that race um logistics logistics is the biggest thing um then obviously it goes right back down to to prep of the vehicle taking that extra step um you know for you know your car or whatever it may be um but logistics uh knowing how long your guys can stay awake for not keeping them awake too long. Cause remember they're, they're chasing like Baja 1000 for this one. It went all the way down to La Paz. So that was 1200 plus miles. Um, and we're looking at, you know, 28 hours, 29 hours, 30 hours of just nonstop racing. Um, that put into, that's just start of the race. 
that the pit crews, everybody else has already been up, you know, five, six, seven, eight hours before that. So we're talking almost 40 hours, you know, uh, 35 to 40 hours of just nonstop, just moving. Um, so understanding what gas stations actually run out of gas because down, you know, further south and down, uh, further down south in Mexico, they actually do run out of gas or they close at like nine o'clock at night and then you could be stranded out there. So knowing that, um, knowing what parts to put where for what sections, pre-running comes into play with that. Um, and then also, you know, just knowing who is going to be in each truck, you know, uh, seeing, you know, everybody's got a specialty. So seeing what vehicles have who in them is, is definitely key. Um, little things like snacks and food and all that stuff, you're going to load up a cooler. So little things, all those little things, and you got to spread it out amongst 1200 miles in Baja, you know, um, knowing what roads are safe and all that. And then now moving over to the race car, um, little things like, um, uh, you know, Cryoheat is one of our sponsors. Um, Josh's transmissions, Cryoheat's transmissions, uh, take that extra step for, you know, getting the gears to be stronger, getting the bearings to be stronger, uh, get all the flashing out of the cases. And those little details over that amount of time make a huge difference. Um, I mean, I'm racing Baja 1000s and pulling oil out of the transmission, and it's still got a good color to it. Um, it's not burnt or black or anything like that. So those little details like that is, is what makes a huge difference from winning and losing. Um, along with snacks in the race car, um, you know, your diet for the race before the race, you know, all that stuff goes into play to, to win that race. So, so when we're talking about the Baja or just any kind of long desert race, you know, we're talking about a lot of heat, a lot of friction, a lot of, uh, oils yeah. and lubricants come up a big part of how your car, uh, survives. Um, you know, how is, how over the years have you approached that differently? You mentioned cryo heat, but like back in the days when you were racing 900s in the, <laughs> in the desert and then moving on up to the thousands, turbos, whatever's, uh, you know, how is your approach to the longevity of the, of the car, the motor, how you drive it, like what you put in it, things like that. How's that changed? Yeah. Um, little tricks with, um, just the type of oil you use, uh, whether you use the Polaris brand or, or Lucas or, or Royal purple is like what I use. Um, so it just, it just all depends, you know, we've tried other oils and, and it didn't really work out too well. Uh, we've actually gone to the extreme of testing oils because we used to do that, uh, back in the one, two, 1600s and 516 days of testing the viscosity of the oils after a race, you get a little sample and you send it out to certain people or whatever. And they test it and say, yep, this is what broke down. It broke down about this long into it, whatever it is. Um, so you get to understand it a little bit more that way. It's just, you know, peace of mind to know that, you know, that, that can, that type of oil can take this kind of, this kind of, uh, abuse to it. So, you know, oils and, and things like that are, are one <laughs> thing, but, uh, the CVT, uh, you know, the, what everybody says is the Achilles heels of UTV. It's not really an Achilles heel, but it is a factor. Um, yeah. you know, kind of what's your process. Do you guys do blowers? Do you guys do, you obviously don't run open case, but, um, you know, airflow is a big thing. And on like the new pro R, you know, they've invested into that too. Now they got two index and including one from the front hood and, um, mm -hmm. temperature is, is a huge part of long, the longevity of a belt and how fast it wears and how, how much it stretches and stuff like that. Kind of what's the commonality on Baja on how you treat that critical part of your machine. Um, we're to the days now that we can run a Baja 1000 with one belt um, and, and run up top, you know, with one belt. So when people are like, well, you know, we're always blowing belts and all that stuff. And the first thing I got to say is when was the last time you serviced your clutches? Um, because we're not blowing belts. Um, I just raced them in 400, one belt on both cars. Um, yeah, it, it, it works. So if you take the, the necessary steps to take care of your clutches, your CBTs, um, you know, checking the rollers on both primary, secondary checking the fingers, making sure they're clean, make sure no debris in there. All that, all that stuff is, is sounds very basic, but a lot of people forget to do that. Uh, resurfacing the clutches with, you know, excuse me, just alcohol on the clutches, um, the inside sheaves, scotch bright, you know, whatever it is, just to get all that, that built up, you know, um, carbon crap, whatever you want to say um, in there. It's, it's just maintenance maintenance you know 900 days back then it was a little <laughs> different um you'd probably swap the belt out every lap or whatever but we've all grown together um polaris can am cowie whoever it is you know everybody's kind of grown together to to raise those cbts up to the next level so you a factory belt guy or uh or aftermarket uh so far factory man <laughs> I've, I've tried i've tried other belts and, and i get the most life out of a factory so they're, they're they put a lot of money into making a product they can sell right they they're not there to, to yeah. break belts so 
Yeah. Um, so going to Baja, I mean, everyone that you, you look, you go on social media, the first thing you see about Baja is tacos. <laughs> like the first thing <laughs> everyone posts is we're yeah. getting our tacos. Uh, yeah. I mean, what, what tradition, the, obviously the cult, the food culture and just the, the, the communities down there are very unique and, uh, something you can only experience across the border. Uh, but yeah. what else about Baja racing? What about that location, that whole segment of, you know, that Gulf of California area, that whole segment of Mexico, like what's special about that to you? Dude, it's, it's places that 90%, 95% of the people in the world will never see. I mean, you can only get in there with a race car or if you know how to get there with like a dirt bike or whatever it is, um, the scenery, you'll be an open desert, nasty whoops. And then you go up and over a mountain and all of a sudden it's just a huge oasis for miles and miles and miles. And you're going through palm trees, little streams, then you'll leave that section and then you'll go up into the pine forest or whatever and cross some streams. And then, then you'll leave that section and be on a dry lake bed. And then you'll leave that. And then you, now you're in sand. I mean, like straight sand dunes. So it changes so much. It has so much to offer as, as to here in the States, it's like, well, we're going to race in Northern Nevada. You know, we're going to race in Pahrump or whatever. Okay. It's like Rocky and, and, and dusty. You know? <laughs> yeah. Silt, you know, um, you'll never see a tree. You'll never see a palm tree. You'll maybe see a cactus here too. Um, but it doesn't, it just kind of stays the same. Um, does that change your perspective as a driver or even maybe a co-driver? Like the experience of the race, like uh, I, I, I came it to like kind of how we do our off-road, uh, travels, be, uh, the overlanding travels that we do that, you know, you're experiencing, you're seeing, you're smelling, you're, you're taking everything in while you're doing it. You have objectives of mileage per day to get somewhere, yeah. but, but you're taking it in and it's a whole lot different than just going to the normal mountain, the normal ORV park, the whatever. Um, is that kind of true for racing? It, it, do you have a different experience in locations like that? Yeah, a hundred percent. So me particularly just speaking for myself is, so I solo all my races. Um, last year, you know, we did the Baja 1000 and I did that one for, I think it was like 26 hours. It took me to do that one. So I set little goals for myself. Of like, Oh, I remember this section, like going through, you know, San Felipe and mash and whoops. Like I'm going to be ready for that. You know, I'm excited for that. And then right after that, dude, I get to go through like oasises and streams and, and, and then back to the, you know, LA Bay area or whatever it is and see the ocean, see the sunrise. So I set little things like that to be able to see all those things. And I'm excited to see each individual spot as for like co-drivers and all that stuff. I know that they think about their sections. They're like, Hey, my section is going to be all whoops or my section is going to be a little bit of whoops and rocks and bottlenecks or whatever it is. So everybody has their own way of looking at that. Um, you know, like Justin's program, when I went over there, I was, I was kind of more the newer driver, uh, you know, to Victor Herrera and Justin. So they're like, here's the nastiest, darkest section. Have fun. <laughs> you know, it's like, all right. So I, I know what I got to take. And, and, and I knocked out, you know, my section very well. Um, again, we just had bad luck there, but that's just, you know, kind of nobody's fault, you know? Um, yeah. So when you get uh, into Mexico, and and I'm and I'm asking these questions because a lot of the listeners really just have no clue about Baja. And <laughs> I grew up in Yuma, Arizona, as a child, um, literally miles away from where guys go racing and and experience the wonders of of Mexico. And I never yeah. once went there. Like it was never a part of my family's culture. It was never a part of any of that. So I never experienced it. And so I'm literally somebody from the area that's never seen it or here done it or whatever. <laughs> So a lot of my listeners are in the same the same boat. So again, going back to the Mexico, when you start up near the border, start working your way mm -hmm. down south towards the tip, like how does the culture change? How does the how does the experience change as you go further down? Um, it's it's definitely, I mean, just because it's a border town, um, you know, Tijuana and Rosarito and Ensenada and all that stuff is still kind of border town. So there's a lot of American influence. A lot of people speak Spanish or a lot of people speak English there. Um, you know, the U S dollar is still taken there everywhere. And, and so it's, it's all fine when that stuff, it's more, when you get to the Southern part, you cross that, that Southern, that Southern point, um, it's literally marked. Um, so it's like Baja California, uh, Northern and then Southern, um, and the Southern part, it's, it's not as Americanized. Um, people aren't used to seeing chase trucks and vans and race cars everywhere. So they're super excited for us to be there. It's like, it's refreshing um, to see that again, what Ensenada and Tijuana, what you, it used to be. We've been doing it for years now, decades now, and, and, and the northern part. So it's like, it's kind of like, oh, they're here again. That's cool. You know, we'll take care of them. But 
right now COVID kind of changed a few things down there. So it's a little bit different, um, but crossing that Southern, that Southern border down there, the, the Northern Southern uh, Baja California portion, it's a huge difference, man. I, I definitely missed it down there. Um, it's, it's all fun. Everybody enjoys it and welcomes us to be there. Um, of course, there's a few bad apples, you know, a couple cops or whatever that like to mess with people, but you know, that's just any third world country. <laughs> well, I don't know if we want to call Mexico third world the entire thing, yeah. but the it, there yeah, is no, a lot not of the entire thing. No. <laughs> that but, maybe that little area, that little area is just uh, is interesting sometimes. So. so I was actually thinking kind of about that reception that you get, right? Like you go um, into the northern part of, of Mexico, and it's a lot of like just you. There's just tourist spots. Like you go to the restaurants, you go to the hotels, you go to whatever, um, and then as you go down further you start to see people actually like their percent, like you were saying, the perception of you is different. Um, yeah. And so the racers, they start handing out stickers and photos and posters and signing stuff. And it becomes more, it's almost like a soccer nation. Like, you know what I yeah. mean? Like you go football over in South America or <clears throat> Europeans, like those guys go anywhere. All of a sudden kids start running out of their houses, looking for, you know, objects or whatever. Yeah. Um, is, is how I would assume as a normal white American in North America, <laughs> that that's a completely different culture shock when you when you start to see that like it's a different appreciation for um, just the fact that something's happening, like that there's people coming in the town paying money to do stuff. Like I would assume that there's a whole different response to that. Um, how does that contrast to America? Like is is that something that makes it more enjoyable to go race there versus America? And how can like America be better about some of these long distance, long endurance races? Um, it, we're definitely received there with open arms, um, for sure. I mean, my team specifically will, will save, you know, grocery shopping for maybe down there to Mexico, just to provide a little more income down there. And we won't go to the big old stores, you know, we'll go to the mom and pop stores is what, personally what we like to do. Um, just, just to give that money back to them, you know, to, to, as, as dumb as it may sound is like, kind of like a, Hey, it's a thank you for letting us here and race you know we'll bring more money into your economy and, and to the mom and pop stores you know um we're definitely received a lot better down there um there's not as many restrictions as some of the stuff there should be because of accidents we've had in the past in mexico um but that's man that's just everywhere but um so but we're definitely received a lot more you could just drive in your truck or in your jeep and just go out in the middle of the race course and just park and watch there's no specific areas so my point of that is that we're driving in the middle of nowhere and all of a sudden you'll come up to a group of, you know, Jeeps that are in places that I don't even know how they got there. Um, <laughs> it's, and I don't know how they're going to get out is the crazy thing because now you got 150, 200 race cars going through the same course they did to get in there, which was smooth, but now it's just like, so <laughs> you're out there and all they want to do is just have fun, hang out and help you get to the finish line. So if you pull over for a flat, they, that's like their highlight of the day. Um, and that's not only Americans that are over there. There's locals. There's locals that do the same exact thing. And, and they're just wanting to help you out and wanting to get in touch with, with what you're doing. And so that we're received a lot better. Um, in the United States here, it's super fun, um, super fast. But there's only sections that you get to see crowds or people. Um, I think different race organizations are different. Um, with, you know, whether it be Mad Media or the Martellis with a bunch of sections throughout the race course that are designated for spectators or best in the desert that it's just like, a, hey, here's where the start is. Here's where the finish is. See you guys later kind of thing. Um, or even Legacy. Legacy is now stepping up with that stuff, too. You know, there's that's another organization. They're all around, you know, Nevada and all that stuff. And they're doing the same thing. You know, I think they're taking best in the desert score and, and Mad Media stuff into one, you know, so, which is kind of cool to see, you know? So, um, the, the idea of racing out and having these random pods of people showing up on the race course. Um, one story that I always like to hear is the racers talking about when you see photographers, you know, something's about to happen, right? Yeah, that <laughs> do, is a, do you have any stories around that? that? <clears throat> oh yeah. Yeah. I mean, we, everybody knows that Baja tale of and or the Baja, the Baja rule is that if you're in the middle of nowhere and you see all of a sudden you see a crowd of people in one designated spot, you should probably put your head on a swivel because there's something coming. They're not there for a straightaway. They're not there for a little, you know, silt section. They're there for something better. And uh, <laughs> you want to be looking. 
So, so have you ever come around a corner, seen a bunch of people and just gone, you know, for a 24, 30 foot jump? Yeah. And <laughs> yeah, there's a pre-running, you know, we'll see little sections of what they're setting up. You know, we pre-run normally the week of the race. So we'll see some of the stuff that they're already building to, to make it more interesting for everybody. Um, sometimes that you see the lip and it's like, man, this was like a professional track designer. Like you could just, you could hit that lip, no problem. Or sometimes you run into a giant hole that instead of digging, you know, for a jump, they just dig a, a six foot, seven foot hole. That's like 10 feet wide. And you're coming at 80. Um, they want to see carnage, you know, <laughs> it's not everywhere, but there's some places out there that they, uh, they get bored. So, so how much of the course do you actually pre-run? Do you pre-run the entire course or just sections of it that, you know, you need to go look at? Um, I definitely focus on sections I need to go look at, um, but I try to pre-run the whole entire course. This Baja 1000 this past year, um, or a few weeks ago, or whatever it was. Um, <laughs> yeah, that was only it, not too long ago. But <laughs> yeah, I know. <laughs> Nonstop. Um, but yeah, um, that Baja 1000, it's a long race, It's and, and I had like a middle section. So we decided, drive what you could see. It's such a long race um, that... I think it's, it, this is all up into everybody's opinion, but it's, it's one of those races that if you pre-run, you're only going to go faster. Is that going to actually help you? Because now you're going faster. Now you're going to make a mistake in such a long race. You're going to be abusing your car a lot more, or you can look at it the other way of, of you pre-ran. So, you know, not to abuse the car in this section, you know, so it, it's, it's, it's up into everybody's opinion about that. We personally didn't pre-run the whole thing. Um, I think we pre-ran maybe like uh, maybe half of it. Um, it just wasn't logistically it's expensive um, and it's hard to do it. But most of the time, though, Baja 1000 last year that I did, I pre ran the whole thing. Baja 500, I'll pick big sections, um, but there are sections that like the coast is the coast. Um, everybody takes the pictures there and all that stuff. But that's not that's not where the real racing's happening. <laughs> yeah, you know, it'll it'll happen. But we try to pre run other sections to set up ourselves for that section to be just free and clear of everybody, you know, so. Yeah, it's all. So when you yeah. when you start talking about going thousands of a thousand miles through the desert, um, you know, navigation is a huge part of that. Um, and you know, most people have a co driver that works with them to let them know something's coming up or a fast, slow, left, right, up, down, whatever. Um, you know, how does navigation play into that for you guys? Like, are you using uh the lead nav system? Are you guys using like Garmin's? Or, like, how does that work for you guys? And and how do you prep? Do, they, do you get that like the week of the uh, the week before, like, how does that work? Um, so we actually use lead nav. So we have the whole mob armor set up with the iPad, um, on there. We've had that for years. Um, and now with like Onyx being, you know, what it is now, we'll kind of cross-reference both of them, um, and just kind of see landowners, whatever it may be, uh, trails. Well, Cause a lot of whatever. it's private, right? Yeah. And so you kind of want to set yourself up for certain sections to know, you know, the ins and outs of that section just in case or whatever, whether access roads or where maybe a, a landowner is or whatever it is. Um, so it's just a nice thing to know. Um, but yeah, we do we do that. We do lead nav. Um, I have different co-drivers for specific sections. Uh, I'm definitely blessed to, to have a few guys on my team. Um, so it's, it's, it's definitely huge. There's some sections that GPS doesn't really do anything for you. You know, um, there's a lot of sections though that it's like, Unfortunately, you're not looking up at the scenery. You're just looking straight at the screen for hours. Especially so when like, you're in the thick of everybody in the same section, right? When it's getting super dusty uh, and, and you can't really see more than um, 10 feet in front of your car. You have to rely on that equipment. Um, yeah. As far as the GPS reception out there, is that a thing or is it pretty solid all the way through? It's it's pretty solid. So Mob Armor is set up with lead nav. Um, and then we also have uh, the dual Sky Pro. It's like a... I don't that's know, what i have on my car too yeah. yeah so it's like a, a hockey puck to, you might as well just create, call me a baja you know? racer because i have a GPS <laughs> i know there, right so. <laughs> you already got everything there um yeah so we use that system um and then the second car that we now have um we did a dual system on that one with it's a lorance and also a, the ipad so the driver can see the lorance and then also the co-driver can see the ipad so just kind of a redundant system as a backup you know and, you know, when you're talking about <clears throat> taking a lot of these, you know, unseen routes and whatnot, <clears throat> excuse me, um, what, uh, what kind of faith buck, butt pucker moments are, are involved with that? Cause I mean, you, you really, like you were saying, sometimes there's obstacles, sometimes the track changes. Um, what, how do you balance speed and caution in those times? 
Um, man, that's that's a that's a good question. That's uh, a I don't. I just pin it to win it. <laughs> yeah, I, I mean, in all honesty, like the best thing I can say is just over the years, um, reaction times. Um, whether it's stuff that I do physically, uh, just training for reaction times. Um, you know, little games. You know, whatever it is, um, just to to make the mind think a little bit faster. Um, that's honestly, that's the only thing I could really say is it's just, if you want to win, you definitely got to go fast. Um, there's a lot, a lot of, uh, incidents that happen out there in Mexico. Um, again, yeah, you just got to keep your head on a swivel. That's the best thing. <laughs> hey, you know? So when we talk about those, those incidences and accidents and, and whatever's like, what kind of safety things do you got going on with the car and yourself and, and your, you um, know, how you're set up in the car, like what kind of safety things go into play there? Um, so I definitely look at access roads, how I said, I use like Onyx off road and look at access roads and landowners when there's like super remote areas. Um, just so I'm familiar with, uh, you know, sections of how to get in and out if I need to, um, helicopters run through my mind, all that stuff. I'm lucky that I have a lot of, uh, off duty firemen and in, in my, my group. So one of my co-drivers is a retired garden Grove fireman. Um, other guys are, you know, battalion chiefs from LA city or whatever it is. Um, so we have medical staff with us and then myself, um, you know, being a fireman as well. So I'm, I'm educated on the, on that stuff. Um, yeah, I mean, we, we have first aid kits on all the vehicles, um, on the race car, we have the Savage UTV medical aid kit and we, we added Shout a few out to things Matt. to that one. Yeah. <laughs> um, and then, uh, on all my trucks, we have his kits on the trucks as well, plus a little extra. Um, yeah, so it's, safety is definitely a big thing. Medical is always crossing my mind for sure. Um, and I know my guys feel safe when they see the first aid kit in every single truck. Um, at driver's meetings, I'll point it out and make sure everybody knows that they're familiar with it. So they're, they know that I've taken those precautions, you know. And I think it's a, a good responsibility to put on both the drivers and the teams to at least have somebody in both locations that has some sort of knowledge on how to treat and respond yeah. to certain things. A lot of times we go out into the hills and there's a lot of 530 club or whatever going on and not a single person <laughs> out there knows how to respond to a situation, right? Like we've talked about in our podcast before, you know, there's a certain level of knowledge you need to have about how to survive when you get yourself out into the woods and out into the trails and out to the desert and stuff like that. Like growing up as a kid in, in Arizona, you know, my parents and my, my school system and everything made it a, a point to make sure that we knew how to survive overnight in the desert, how to, you know, identify what bit you like, you know, if so be able to tell, communicate to other people what happened. Yeah. Um, you know, like I, I find that as a huge priority that people just overlook way too often. Yeah. Yeah. Definitely. The, the MacGyvers are, are necessary. We need, we need MacGyvers in every truck. Um, we can give guys a pair of vice grips, uh, duct tape and some needle nose and they can do pretty much anything. <laughs> so we had a MacGyver incident like two weeks ago with the, the mint 400. So, so speaking yeah. of the mint 400, that's where I was going next. Um, you, you transitioned pretty much overnight to being a Baja race team to being a mint 400 race team in the United States. Um, now you have two cars in your, in your arsenal that you were racing with, um, kind of yeah. explain the two cars, the differences, like how they're built or whatever. And then, yeah. um, and then, and then we'll get into the team and everything else. Yeah. 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 So, uh, at the mid 400, I've always wanted to run two cars. Um, I just thought it'd be cool to challenge myself to be able to, to prep two cars and get them both at the finish line. So we got the opportunity to do that. So we got another race car and it's a two seater Polaris platform. Um, and we had a good friend, Cynthia uh, Gutierrez, she drove that one. And then I had my, my, uh, four seat car, four seat chassis with two seater. Um, we had that one, the normal one. So, so it which, was, which the classes did you guys run in? Uh, so we were actually both ran in the same class. So we ran in a pro, uh, pro NA. So, um, and, and so when you're thinking about the mint 400 versus the Baja, I mean, the mint 400 is a much shorter race, but it's still a very grueling race. Um, yeah. and it's not as varied as Baja, right? Like you were saying all the train changes and you come yeah. around a corner to a different area or whatever, but it's still very challenging. How do you approach yeah. the mint versus Baja outside of the um, you know scale? The, the mint is definitely a, how can I stay in the gas the whole time kind of a race? Um, it is gnarly to say that, that you're going to just keep it pinned for 400 miles straight. Um, anybody that thinks uh, a Baja 500 or a mint 400 isn't a sprint race now is, is definitely behind the curve. Um, all these cars are super reliable. 
we're definitely pinning it for 400, 500 miles nonstop. The Baja 1000 is the only race or maybe Vegas Serena, maybe slightly um, that everybody's like, okay, we got to tone it down a little bit. Maybe we won't pre-run this section, you know, stuff like that. But 500, San Felipe 250, Mint, you know, all those races are pinned. So we came into the Mint with, we got to keep the gas down the whole time. Uh, it's time to switch off the Baja mentality and, and just hammer down. Cynthia's car, um, our second car, B car, we mainly wanted that one to get to the finish um, with no issues, no stops, no nothing. Because we knew if we did that and she just kept moving, we gave her a car to just keep moving, um, she would be top 10. And actually, it was pretty successful. She got eighth. So, And, where, and just where did you finish on that one? I finished fifth. So, yeah. <laughs> we had, had, uh, we had an issue. Up. We had a little issue. Yeah, we had a little issue. Um, um, yeah. So, so Cynthia, um, she's from uh, Canada, right? Uh, she's yep. a Canadian nati- native, uh, mm-hmm. and she actually drives monster trucks for a living, as far as I can tell. Yeah. Uh, if you look at her Instagram ca- account and everything, uh, so she's a, a monster truck driver, which um, we've had a monster truck driver on in the past. Um, it's a it's a whole different mindset of what you do. So how how was yeah. that transition? I mean, has she raced before? Did you work with her before? Has she driven your cars before? How was that transition from that different style to? I mean, I know you guys. I went and did a deep dive, and and you guys have some history back in the days of of racing on the on the the flat course. But um, yeah. you know, kind of give me the history there. How you guys came across working together, and, and what was that transition like to getting her out on this course? Uh, well, she, it wasn't super new to her. Um, she had done little events, um, before, but getting in a car like this full two chassis, um, you know, the suspension that we have and all that stuff was definitely new to her. Um, she's a driver. She's definitely a, a professional athlete. So that mindset already, it shouldn't be, it shouldn't take too long to make it click. So she came over to the house for the, the whole week before the mint and we were hanging out, just talking, just getting to know each other better. Um, and that obviously brought into the race stuff. And then, uh, we just start seeing where we need to work on stuff and where we don't, um, we ended up building the car together. She ended up helping me out like the, the final week of the mint. Um, and then we just took it out to, you know, my backyard kind of thing and, uh, drove it around, did some donuts. Cause you know, it's monster truck. She just wants it. To I, I think that's a prerequisite. So apparently I found out, <laughs> when I'm in the seat. um, so, and just jumping the car and just getting her comfortable, like, Hey, put it in two wheel drive and see what it does. Four wheel drive, see what it does. And, and she picked it up. We maybe put 10 miles on the car and she had it down. Um, then we went to Barstow and trained her a little more on that, on, on hitting the big stuff on maybe how to hit the big whoops. You can't just hit it right in the center, you know, um, you got to kind of figure it out. So we did that and, and dude, she did great. I mean, she picked it up right away. My co-driver and her, I forced them to be together because She's got a little bit of an accent, so I don't want that, you know, motor noise, helmet, being tired to become an issue that my co-driver doesn't understand her or she doesn't understand him. So they spent a lot of time together um, just talking, hanging out, and and it worked out great. Uh, that was something I noticed, uh, just kind of being more more aware of the racing scene this last year uh, than I normally am. Uh, is how much drivers, co-drivers, team members are very fluid year to year. They're not necessarily always the same. So there's a, definitely a, a team dynamic of like we got to get to get to a point where we understand each other's quirks and verbiage and timing and all that kind of stuff. Um, you know, you said that you, they spent the week together or whatever. Like how how important is that knowledge of each other in racing? I mean, is it is it just the fact that you have to do your job well or is it like you have to understand how they're going to react in a certain situation? Yeah, I think it's I think it's reacting in a certain situation. Um, you know, the driver definitely needs to be able to listen. Um, if the driver's not listening, the car is going to break. Um, so if I ask your wife, are you a good listener? Yeah, I, I actually am. <laughs> I, I am. I am. Um, I'll question it as I'm already going that way. <laughs> um, yeah, so it, it definitely works. Um, every co-driver is different on how to communicate. Um, I've luckily, you know, found a few of them that, that always communicate very well with me. We just, we vibe, we click. Um, but then also we've expanded it to each co-driver is good for certain sections. Um, I've got a specific guy that starts the races with me because he knows how to calm me down and, and keep me in that zone. And we, we move from the back of the pack to the front of the pack very fast. Um, and then I got another guy that's really GPS savvy and just keeps me online and, and, and branches out to maybe take, you know, this corner or this corner, you know, and cut a little bit 
Um, then I got another one that is my finisher that he is just pin it, don't let off, you know, and those extra seconds that I'm staying in it, it shows on the, on the clock. It, it definitely shows. And so I call all my co-drivers, my Dr. Phil's, um, <laughs> they listen to my problems and, uh, I don't really listen to theirs. <laughs> so they, uh, they help me out with everything that's going on. Um, yeah, man, it's, it's, a uh, it's a cool relationship to have in there and, and to train somebody and get Cynthia, um, to get along with, with Daniel, her co-driver, within a week. It, yeah, man. I mean, to throw somebody to do a 400 mile race, that's never done it, never driven that long. She was just like, I'm going to be in the car for nine hours. Like I've never been in a car that long, like never, ever, ever. And then right. racing on top of that, you know? So there's a lot to, to battle with that, but do they, they all killed it. You know, I think one flat tire and lost a brake line was like the only thing. So. Right. And that seems to be kind of like the common, <laughs> the common thing you see around race day is people pinching off brake lines and, and yeah. rolling tires back to camp. Um, and, uh, hopefully you, you, you're able to recover those pieces <laughs> from the race course. Yeah. Um, you know, I think that's kind of an interesting thing, uh, about like Baja and stuff is where, you know, guys just send it into whoops or send it into G outs or whatever. And all of a sudden their front, their front flender or the front end, the clip, the whatever is out now a hundred yards away and, you know, mm -hmm. kids are picking it up and taking it home, putting it up on their walls. Oh, I think yeah. that's very unique, uh, for that kind of racing. Um, you know, what are, what are some of your kind of memories of, of those situations where you just sent it into something and said, well, that's going to stay there. <laughs> oh yeah. So it, that's happened. I mean, still to this day, I will pre-run or I'll go to like rides after the race and I'm still fanboying over like I'm hitting the race course the week after the race. And because we just went out for a ride and I see a fender of like, uh, you know, I don't know, uh, um, Harley Lettner's truck or, 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 you know, as somebody else's truck or whoever it is. Um, and I'm like picking it up, like I'm taking this <laughs> home, I'm taking this home, you know, this is so badass. Um, I've had fenders fly off. Um, I've, I have left tires before it's now very well controlled not to leave your equipment out there. Um, yeah, I mean, I, I try not to leave anything out there. I've lost stuff out there though. Um, and I've, you know, broken an axle in the middle of a crowd that we pull over. I broke an axle and pulled over in the middle of a crowd. Sunset's coming down. I still had my sunglasses and I'm changing the axle. And then I just say like, where am I going to put these glasses? And I just give them to a kid and right. he is just pumped over the you know yeah oh yeah so it's it's cool to see that you know so it's it's fun it's fun <laughs> so talking about the mint um kind of what are some of your your memories from the mint like i the i always seem to think that like what you see on social media is kind of like that that thing where it, you're you're doing your media ops you're doing your posts for your sponsors you're doing whatever um but what what are some of those takeaways that you have from those even Baja or Mint, like what are some of those memories you have that aren't really necessarily for social media or whatever, but that you would never give up for the world? Um, honestly, man, is and we don't even post it either, is like the night before the race, um, the days before the race, the the first day we're in town for the race is those memories for me are are the biggest ones. Um, do the race is fun, but having, you know, dinner with my guys and, and <clears throat> we're all there for one, one goal and we're all there to win. We all want to be there. Um, it's, it's all volunteers. It's just one family. Um, so to hang out and be able to have dinner and talk, you know, whatever we're talking about. Um, yeah, dude, that's, those are those memories that I, that I love for sure. You know, um, packing eight dudes, nine dudes in a toy hauler and <laughs> the night before the race and just hanging out, talking, you know, and, and, going over, you know, whatever we're talking about, somebody's going to universal studios and then somebody's doing this. And all of a sudden we revert back to, Oh wait, Hey, what are we going to do at pit two? What are we going to do? Oh, this, this, and this, and this. Okay, cool. And then we go back to the conversation. So those conversations for me mean a lot to me. Um, the, we, we do very well with documenting the behind the scenes stuff and the little lifestyle of all my races. So we have a lot of good videos on my Instagram. Like we have a whole series for the mint 400, uh, called into the dirt. So we, we record everything from when we picked up Cynthia to prepping the car, to getting her out and testing, to race day footage, to finishing the race, to, to everything, going out and hanging out and, you know, having a couple of beers or whatever it is. So we did really good in documenting that. So you guys got to check that out. Um, <laughs> so we've, we've seen a, we have a couple of clips here and there, but I'm sure you guys have a, yeah. a, some sweet features to be dropping here pretty yeah. soon. Yeah. Yeah. We actually just dropped it yesterday, I think. 
I think, yeah, I, I remember. I haven't I been in front of my computer for about 30 hours. I know, so. I know. <laughs> And I'm sure um, you haven't either. You, you've been working yeah. nonstop trying to catch up at uh, as yeah. a fireman. So yeah. how, how's life as a, a <clears throat> Southern uh, California firefighter these days? <laughs> it was good. Um, it's, you know, it's just that the, that's how it is. Everybody asks, like, do you still work or like, are you doing this full time? And this is, this racing is definitely a full-time job. Um, it, it's, it's, I'm blessed to be a fireman and, and I'm definitely a fireman first. Um, so it's, it's fun. Um, I'll do a bunch of trades and work overtime and disappear for a few weeks racing. And I come back and I just put my head down and I bury myself at work. So I know you and I have been trying to touch bases here. <laughs> so um, for those that are yeah. uh, in on the inner circle here, uh, we started earlier in the week and kept getting interrupted by uh, uh, some alarms calls coming in and, and yeah. pulling you away from the camera. So uh, I appreciate yeah. you having time. You are actually at the fire station right now. Yeah. Correct? Yeah. Yeah. So I'm in, uh, in my room right now. So, <laughs> so at any moment the alarm could go off and he could disappear. So we've gotten some really yeah. good luck today having you on the call already for 40 well, minutes. So. Last time, last time it was a, the one rainy day in Southern California. So it's just like popping off every like 20, 30 minutes. We're getting something, you know, so is it, just, uh, yeah. is it slick streets? Is it just people not being ready? Yeah. Is it just incompetence? Yeah. What is it? People just don't know how to drive in the rain, but that's all it is. <laughs> that's all it is, man. Holidays, rain, sales. I don't know what it is. It's just they don't drive in the rain. I th I think they just want to see you guys. They just, they're just like, we got to <laughs> see those firefighters out here again. Right. <laughs> There's a few frequent flyers that, that call us all the time. <laughs> Are they like 85 years old and, and needing yeah. a help out? Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yep. So, so um, I was looking at, at, like I said, I had done a, a deep dive on Instagram or whatever, just to kind of get familiar with some, some photos when I blue on white and black color scheme. That has been your motto since yeah. 900 days. And before that, even in the flat track yeah. stuff. So, um, kind of give me a background on, on where those colors came from. Um, so Rancho racing kind of goes into that. So Rancho racing was, uh, my, my parents had an auto parts store for since like 1987, 1986. And they recently retired and recently sold it like three years ago. So I grew up in the mechanical era and their low, their colors were always blue. Um, new era with me and all that stuff. You know, I, I liked, I kept the blue, the Rancho logo, um, the wolf howling in the moon and all that stuff. And then, you know, the Rancho stuff. And then I branched off with the Rancho racing stuff um, and just kept that, the blue and the white stuff going Little by little, bit branched out with the, the teals and the silvers and, and <laughs> the flashy stuff, the flashy stuff, you know. I think so. it's important that, you know, people have an identity, especially when it comes to racing, where you're representing uh, brands that are sponsoring you to become more of a, an actual brand to the community. Um, and so that definitely plays into it. Um, you know, when it, when we talk about sponsorships and racing and stuff, we get a lot of people talking, um, you know, I'm, I want to start getting into this racing thing with the UTVs. Like it's, it's more affordable nowadays. I would c counter that with, it's not necessarily more affordable. It's just <laughs> less crazy expensive. <laughs> yeah. Um, you could finance these race programs right now with these UTVs, you know? Yeah. It's, uh, but uh, yeah, it's crazy. the the kind of the question that I was having was, you know, you talked about documenting your your race program, you know, from beginning mm -hmm. to the after the race, right? The, the prep, the people, the during, the after. Um, and we've talked with other racers in the past about becoming more active on social media and becoming more of a value to your sponsors. How has that changed over the last couple of years, especially with COVID? And and where are you guys at now when you think about returning value <laughs> to your sponsors? If someone's looking to get into racing. What are some of the first things they should be thinking about uh, about learning how to represent the sponsors and the brands and return value to their program? Yeah, don't ask for free. Stop asking for free. <laughs> that's the, that's, <laughs> that's the like the number, number one, one flag that pops up. Dude, it's it's crazy. I, I talk to my sponsors and it's like, dude, you have no idea how like I'm starting a race team. I'm gonna do this, this, and this. So can you give me this product? And they're asking for like two, three grand in product, you know, it's like, you guys can't, we can't do that. We can't do that. Um, know your place and, and, and how you're doing it, set goals, um, of what your, your end goals are. It was like, Hey, I eventually want to go for a championship. I eventually want to race the Baja 1000 and then start in the AV series, start in the work series, start in legacy, start, you know, not necessarily small, but start something that's affordable, that's reachable. And, and the best thing to do is, is, don't expect free. Don't expect discounts. Have be ready to pay for it when you make the call to ask for 
support, for asking for help, you know, be ready to pay for it. That shows a lot. You know, you got to take it as you're taking food off of everybody's plate that you're hitting up. You know, you can go to Pro Eagle and ask him for a free jack, but why would he give you a free jack? So why don't you buy a jack, take some cool pictures, support him. Now he supports you. Um, so it's it's some of those things, you know, and, and you know, axles, belts, Polaris, Kawasaki, Honda, whoever it is, you know, if you keep that mentality that you're taking food off of their table, what are they going to get for you getting an extra plate at their table? You know, if you have that in mind, I think that's it's a huge thing. Um, Social media is your resume. Um, you still, we still have our, our resumes and all that stuff. Um, but social media is your resume, man. That's that's the biggest thing. That's something that we don't race every day. We don't race every month. Um, that's that's what you have to do. Um, a lot of people are doing these builds in their garages. Um, show stuff like that. Show what it takes to build a car. I, hey, I don't know what I'm talking about. I just bought this Polaris Razor. I just bought this Can Am. Um, I want to go racing next week and this is what I'm going to do. I think I got to go to PRP to get window nets. Uh, dude, I need a Jack, you know, I need to go to the pro Eagle. I need to do, you know, X and X and X and people will, will relate to that. And, and it'll be entertaining because they're going to see you mess up and, and they're going to learn from it and they'll learn from it too. So, so when, when you've gotten into the racing, uh, program and you're, you're starting to get miles under your belt and you're starting to figure out how to post and, and how to be representative. And um, we've talked with other racers about your attitude on the course and your attitude in the way you talk to sponsorships and and even the ones that are not sponsoring you, the ones that are around you that talk to each other and, and all that. It's super important to be a representative 100% of the time, 24-7, never let off. And um, I, think it's, I think the biggest misconception with racing and sponsorships, speaking from the outside to someone that watches it, right, is how you represent yourself as a, an extension of those brands, right? Like part of it is, yeah. is, rep, is showing the logo, showing the product, whatever. The other part of it is, um, like we've talked with like Blake Wilkie before or people that are related to Blake Wilkie. And, he, and they always say, you know, the, I've seen that guy sell stuff, you know, through experiential communication outside of normal hours, like 1am at the local bar, like hanging out with buddies, just trying to relax. And all of a sudden they're talking about, you know, tires or something like, and, and being 100% honest about it and not being, you know, a salesman or, you know, just another talking head. Like he believes in the product. He believes in, in what he's receiving from that company and he's going to do whatever it takes to give it back to that sponsor. Um, I think that's one of the biggest misconceptions about yeah. racing and sponsorships is you are that brand, no matter where you go, yep. what time of day and who you're with. Yeah. That, that word ambassador, that word sponsored athlete, that word, you know, racer support it means a lot to to all these sponsors um yeah man you got to treat it as now you're part of that company um and you treat it as such you know which you want somebody talking bad about your product or not knowing about your product you know you go and call somebody that like hey i saw um you know a summer's brothers axle or i saw a cryo heat sticker on your car so i called up cryo heat and say hey can you sponsor me well what do you what do you want like what are you looking for well you know, the, what you do for other people, it's like, wait, you called cryo heat and not knowing what we do, right. um, not knowing what fits on your car. So already you're off to a bad start. So educate yourself on a company, um, educate yourself on the products they make that adapt to you, what you want to do, you know, don't just go for the very top, you know? Right. And, and I've, I've done that before, just even not being a sponsored athlete or anything. Right. I go up to a brand and be like, Hey, you know, you guys launched this thing with this specific feature on it or whatever. And I think that's really awesome. Like how did, and like, I'm asking them questions. Like, I want to know why they made this better or how they made it better or whatever. And, and, and being like, Hey, I know you did it on the previous version. It looked like this. And now this new version looks like that. Hey, can you tell me why you did that? And I'm really interested to know more about you and your product. And, and all of a sudden now I'm talking to the guy behind me that didn't have that conversation time about that product, that thing. Yeah. Um, and, and brands really connect with that. Yeah. Yeah. Big time. Um, like, breaking it down to what tire you're going to run, you know, you're going to be running, you know, the EFX moto rally or, or whatever tire you, you look at and then, and be ready to ask questions because you can ask, you know, the person that works there, you can ask them questions about that, you know, and, and they'll, they'll take it as like, Oh, okay. This guy's doing a little bit of research. He's putting in a little bit of time. He's making himself educated on my product. So already that's a start in the right direction to like, you know, I may want to help this guy out, you know, so it's, it's, it's definitely one of those things you can't just ask for free. 
um, be ready to pay for it hundred percent of the time and, and be grateful for, for what you get. Um, I think right now, a lot of people are forgetting that, um, this UTV game is, is changing every day. Pro are coming out, you know, rumors of other people having other cars. Um, it's changing and it changes every single year. So, so speaking of the pro R let's talk a little bit about that. Uh, that, that machine's come out. We, we now have a, you know, super mega unlimited class thing going on for it. And, uh, you know, breaking that thousand CC barrier and all that jazz. Um, obviously, uh, the car is really a lot more beefy than the previous versions. It's got a lot more intention behind how they're actually presenting that package. Um, how do you see that car performing well, first of all, have you driven it? How 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 does that car look to you? And then, how do you see the industry changing because of it? I actually have not driven it. Um, I got to sit in somebody's uh, Pro R the other day, and it, dude, the the innovation behind it is super rad. It's like you look at the cage, you look at the suspension, and it's just crazy to think and see it that input that I gave, that RJ Anderson gave, that that somebody else gave, or whoever they they listened and they changed it and they made it better um so that's crazy that like it's so in tune and these manufacturers are listening it's not just polaris it's not just can-am or or whoever it's it's everybody everybody's listening and everybody's adjusting to that so again it's such a small industry to to see that and have that i think these these new cars uh, uh polaris did it again that they set the bar higher um, now everybody has to follow and, and, and follow in suit with this. Um, I think this pro R given it, you know, a few months or, or whatever, it's already kind of raced and it's already been pretty good. Um, yeah, it's, it's, um, it's going to be crazy. <laughs> I know with my car as an NA, um, racing in Baja, like class tens and, and some smaller trucks are, are a problem for me. Um, they're in our way. I, I, I don't even know where this pro R is going to be, but it's definitely going to be fast. So, something that I've been thinking about uh, recently is <clears throat> the fact that they launched obviously the Pro R and then the Turbo R, right? And yeah. so a lot of that technology launched over into this Turbo platform, but also this NA platform. The the NA platform with the the four cylinders and everything is is kind of its own class of like interesting topics going forward. Yeah. I think there's an interesting topic with the Pro tur- the Turbo Pro uh, Turbo R. Mm-hmm. Um, and how that impacts it, because now you're bringing in that the higher class suspension technology and, and all that into, I don't want to say an aging platform, but a platform that's really well established. Um, mm-hmm. do you, do you feel like there is going to be just an onslaught of turbo R's racing next year? Or do you feel like everyone's going to try to jump <laughs> ship into this bigger class? I think, I think it'll be the turbo R's, honestly. Um, the turbo R's are, are like the new turbo S quote unquote, um, and I, I think it's, I think it's a good car. They took what they know works is going to work, and they adapted it to other classes. They adapted it to another car. Um, it's smart for them in a manufacturer standpoint, um, and it's it's a good working car. It's a good working suspension. Um, the Pro XP's got a lot of little you know nice things that make it more comfortable for the for the daily user. And now they just put better suspension on it. Um, they the power band is still kind of the same. Um, but the CVTs are different now. And, and so everything is, everything is adapting and making it better. Um, I'm trying to figure out how to uh, get one right now <laughs> and make it happen. It's crazy out there. Even like, you know, sponsored athletes or pro athletes or however you want to say it, um, they're telling us all the same thing. It's like, Hey man, um, you got to wait just as long, just as everybody else, you know? Right. Um, obviously there's a few more vehicles out there right now that are specifically marketing vehicles, whether they're right. built for race cars, but they were built for marketing, um, product launch. Know, so it's, yeah. So it's, it's, uh, we all got to wait. <laughs> we all gotta wait. <laughs> so, I mean, that was kind of something I was thinking about was, you know, when you look at the purchase of your next car, we're about to record a, you know, what car to buy in 22 episode, like that, the, all these things are in my head and it's interesting to, to look at the counterbalance between, you know, a new platform, big horsepower, lots of potential, uh, awesome suspension, wheelbase, all that kind of stuff. Um, uh, and then looking at like the Turbo R where it's, you know, it's more affordable. It's not necessarily as cheap as it used to be, but it's more affordable than the Pro R. And it has a lot of like you can go and get a tune for it the next day. You can go get, you know, all these different things for it 
that are already established and where that value weighs in the, the balance of, do I want the bigger, newer, or do I want the more established, solid, proven? Um, you know, I think it'll be super interesting, especially for race teams when they're looking at, you know, yeah. parts sharing and, and team sharing and all that kind of stuff. So, um, you know, I think with the pro R, the interesting thing that a lot of people don't give enough airtime to is the fact that they separated out the diffs from the power plant, right? Like, so that transmission isn't at the back holding you down. If it blows, you know, that transmission takes out the whole car, uh, with a yeah. diff that could just be a part in the truck that you just swap out and, and throw it on there yeah. and the drivetrain and everything. So, you know, when, when they start moving towards that kind of stuff, is that some of the input that you guys you know, as a racing industry have provided is like, Hey, we need these things separated out. Or is that more of like Polaris saying, Hey, we're going to tell you that this is a better option. I and mean, this is, this is why. <laughs> yeah. Um, I didn't have any input on that one at all. Um, they've got, solid engineers and i've got the chance to meet a few of them so i know i know they're they definitely overthink it and look at it and and, and make those decisions um i think it's going to work i like the fact that they're changing it they're they're not just stuck in a rut that they're they're going outside of that box and and everybody's going to knock it or some people are knocking it already but dude i mean there's no different than having the turbos they were the first ones to have a turbo in a car and everybody knocked that too everybody knocked the 74 inches wide everybody knocked you know, electronic suspension, it's like, well, look what's now. Trophy trucks are running electronic suspension. They're coming standard on Ford Raptors and Jeeps. And Polaris started a lot of that, you know. I mean, I know it's been around for a little while, but Polaris had the the, the balls to just do it right. and, and right. not care about what people are thinking because they can see past all that. So you got to give them the credit where the credit's due, man. That's pretty badass. We, you know? We've said many times on the show that, you know, Polaris doesn't get some of the credit that, that they deserve on – one really creating you know an industry around this platform two creating a performance and a consumer segment around the platform and three really developing a new off-road racing scene that was pretty much a dying scene at some point where it was just trending downwards where there was less money less sponsors less involvement less races and now it's exploding to have more races more sponsors more technology more units um and uh they don't like you said, they don't get the credit they deserve. I think some of the time, um, especially when we, we get Brian loyal on certain different brands and, and cars and technologies or whatever. Um, we still got to look back kind of like in the racing scene, there's, there's racers back there that you look back at and you say, you push the bar for us to get us to where we're going. Um, and I'm, I'm super excited, uh, you know, what this industry is going to do, what can Am's going to respond with. If, you know, Yamaha will ever, uh, age out of their, management and get a new car out um if you know uh, if we can see some cool new stuff from honda or not like there's a lot of the coolest potential in the industry and i'm super excited about it um you know looking a year or two years away from now what in your racing scene would you be looking forward to would it be you know a dual clutch transmission would it be um you know some sort of turbo program on the four cylinder like as a racer as a race team and what you do what would be something that would be the next evolution for you um, for me, reliability is my biggest thing. So less moving parts, more, uh, less, less things that go wrong is my idea. Um, I like that turbo R, um, the pro R for me, it's not there yet. Um, I personally, just for my race program, that's not what I want. Um, I'll let everybody else do that. And then there's guys that have more support than I do to, that, you know, can deal with those problems if they have any, um, I like the way it's going, man. Um, I honestly can't even tell you what else would be a cool thing. Um, you know, these guys are coming out with all these crazy features that, that make a big difference. And it's like, damn, that's a great idea that I didn't even think about. Um, I like reliability. I like the fact that, that Polaris and, and can I know stepping up with it too. Um, they're making these frames and these roll cages. You don't have to replace them. You know, you really don't have to aesthetics are actually looking okay. Um, strength and durability is, is insane. They're not half welded tubes anymore. They're full, you know, putting on a roaster and, and doing the full thing. Chassis are stronger. Um, so that's that's super cool to, to hear and see and, and be a part of. So looking towards 2022, what kind of uh, things are you looking forward to? What kind of new things are popping up that you're excited about? And, and kind of what's the near term future look like for you and your racing team? Um, so we're going to keep the same car. We're just revamping it, upgrading a couple things, um, that I know Polaris had, had released. So we're going to upgrade a few things on that car. Um, it's a super reliable car. Um, we're still, you know, placing in the top three all the time. Um, so we're going to keep that car and I was going to go for a score championship. Actually, this is the first time I'll say it. Um, I was going to go for a <laughs> championship next year, but 
the way COVID's affecting things and, and the way sponsors are going and, and just how everything is delays, all that stuff. It makes more sense to just keep my, I call it my, the Rancho schedule that a lot of people are now adopting, but big races, man, a uh, uh, mint 400, Baja 500, Vegas, Torino worlds, um, Baja 1000. I think those five races are heavy hitter races. Only the big boys show up to those ones. Um, yeah, I think that's that. That's our schedule for next year. We've done it a few years now. Um, I'd like to go for a championship, but that's just a personal thing. Um, but next year, I think we're going to do those those five heavy hitter races uh, starting off in March with the Men 400. I think that really is a definition between different styles of racers, right? Like there's the guys that just like, I want to own everybody and own everything and all the points and I'm going to take the top yeah. position and everything. And then there's a different style of racer where it's like, you know, we're going to represent our brands in the entire year long, no matter where we're at, what we're doing. And we're going to have an awesome program and we're going to do the best we can at these choice races where we can get the most exposure for our sponsors, the most value out of the race and try to get the crown at that event. Right. And I think that's two yep. different mindsets. And you've obviously chosen that 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 event mindset versus the series mindset. Um, and, and the truth be told, the guys going after the the the, the points and, and all that stuff, that's a much more expensive program. Yeah, it's it's a. Uh... Compared to the races that we're doing my schedule for next year, honestly, it costs about the same. It's probably a little more expensive because it's all big, big races. Um, it's, it's the, I don't even want to say dedication anymore. It's, it's what your sponsors want. Uh, a points championship is, is a sponsor driven thing. I believe um, it's cool to say, you know, bragging rights that you're a points champion and all that stuff. But if I won all those five races that I said, I, I guarantee you, I'm getting more coverage than you are with your points championship. Um, it's just, that's just the fact of it. It sucks that people are dedicating their time and money to go do a championship and they're not getting the credit that they deserve um, for busting ass and doing it all year. But now, you know, these modified schedules, um, we're hitting big races and, and these races are bigger than a lot of the other races. Um, so it definitely takes a lot of money and a lot of dedication to do that as well. So it'd be cool maybe uh, somebody to step up and, and go after all these, you know, whatever, triple crown, whatever you want to call it all these big, big races to make a, a series with that alone, you know, and spread the love to all the organizations. You right. Know? Yeah. And, you know, it's unfortunate because the the smaller s racing circles, they have to rely on the local racers and the, and the regional racers versus all the big money racers. Right. And I'm not saying like you are a big money racer or not a big money racer. I'm just saying like those smaller series are the lifeblood of what builds into an actual money racer right like that that yeah. has oh, to yeah. build it and so we as a community should try to you know intentionally support those series and participate mm -hmm. in those series and volunteer or promote online or whatever uh because th the more effort we put in at the ground level the more we're going to see grow and adopt at the upper levels yeah for sure yeah i mean i started off with you know in, in the utvs i started off in the utvs at the ave series and that's a local cal city race um local cal city series did that for about a year and a half. And then that's when I decided to, to go full board and, and get a full team chassis. So start off small, District 38, um, uh, DP4, AVE, get your feet wet, take a look at it and and support those local guys. Because those local guys, I mean, the Rob Max, the Andy McMillans, all those guys um, started in smaller series, FDR, FUD, you know, all those organizations, all these big, big guys started small first and, and moved up. So they're huge. So you just mentioned that you guys dropped a video. Where can we find the video? Where can we find you guys online? Follow you through the next, you know, season of racing and, yeah. and what you guys are doing. Yeah. So on uh, on Instagram, Rancho Racing, and then uh, RanchoRacing.com as well. We have uh, little stickers and stuff like that for sale there, and then to kind of support the brand. But yeah, Instagram is our biggest thing. Um, we have uh, other accounts as well that I don't really put too much time into, but I'm trying. Um, <laughs> Uh, but yeah, so Instagram, we have all our videos on YouTube there with the Salt and Casey highlights. Uh, we have all the stuff there So we have. We're, we're known for that, uh, documenting it on our stories, putting out like six minute videos of just every single day of what we're doing down there when we're down for a week in Baja, whether we're in Baja or at the mint. So it's a pretty cool lifestyle document series that we do there. So check those out. Awesome. Well, we appreciate you taking the time uh, at work 
<clears throat> um, yeah. and uh, joining us on the podcast. It's it, obviously a back and forth to get that done. Uh, and especially around the holidays and everything, we appreciate your time. Uh, yeah. You can find uh, him at uh, Rancho Racing on the social medias and the YouTubes. Um, you can find us on all the podcast platforms of your preference, along with YouTube video versions of this podcast happen there. We have a show rundown with all the applicable links and topics at our website, sidebysideguys.com. And uh, we, yeah, we got a holiday episode coming up for which, uh, ep- which vehicles to buy for each different segment in 2022 with all the new product launches that have happened this year um, and maybe some rumors that we might throw around. So check out that episode there coming up soon. And uh, until the next time, guys, peace.